All right, I'm going to even just forego the pretense of pretending to change shirts. I'm plowing through here. We're up to screencast three, and this one's called discretionary versus automatic fiscal policy. We're kind of now getting into a little bit of the minutia of fiscal policy. Um, the last couple of screencasts were really the guts of it. It's a pleasant image. All right, so fiscal policy happens basically one of two ways. Um, the first way is called discretionary fiscal policy, and that's everything you learned about in the last screencast. Discretionary fiscal policy is the government thinking about the economy, trying to do things specifically to change the economy, and actively doing things, passing new laws, um, making adjustments to old laws to change either government spending or taxes, one of the two, two tools uh, to make the economy better. So when you think discretionary fiscal policy, think like action verbs, like the government's cutting taxes, implementing a new program, whatever. The other kind, which we haven't really talked about yet, is called non-discretionary, sometimes called automatic fiscal policy. And this has to do with the fact that there's ways that our economy works and there's ways that our government is already structured that lead to basically built in stability, kind of like fiscal policy that just automatically happens without the government actively doing anything. Um, and specifically, that's government spending or taxes that change automatically because the economy changes and change in the way that we want them to change. So let's take the case of maybe aggregate demand getting too high and GDP rising too much and, and the possibility that we might be dealing with inflation. Well, if GDP is really high and there's lots of people working and their jobs are going well, they're going to pay more in taxes, right? We have a progressive tax system and the more money you earn, the higher percentage you pay. So when GDP goes up, taxes go up kind of automatically, not because the rates are getting higher or the government's passing new laws, but simply people are getting jumped up into higher tax brackets. And the flip side of that, government spending and specifically transfer payments, like spending for things like unemployment and welfare and medical care for the needy. When GDP is high and employment is high, there aren't that many needy people. So transfer payments go down, and automatically, as a result of that, government spending goes down. And if you think about these things, they're both exactly what we want when aggregate demand is too high. So what we have here is T going up, G going down. Think back to the last screencast. That is contractionary fiscal policy with the government, without the government actively trying to do contractionary fiscal policy. So again, in terms of the model and in terms of the graph, if aggregate demand is too high, we want aggregate demand to shift to the left. And we can get aggregate demand to shift to the left, in this case, without doing anything. We might move from AD to, in this graph, AD1, right? Push aggregate demand that way, simply because taxes are going up and spending's going down and it's happening automatically. All right, just to talk very quickly and think through the opposite possibility. When GDP is too low, when GDP falls and we have high unemployment, tax revenues go down. Less people have jobs, less spent, less taxes to be paid. Um, and those kind of transfer payments go up. More money for welfare, more money for um, things like unemployment compensation. So if taxes going down, that's like a tax cut. G going up, that's more government spending. That's basically expansionary fiscal policy, again, without the government having to do anything to make it happen. And again, back in terms of our graph, if aggregate demand is too low, we want aggregate demand to get shifted to the right. Ideally, maybe it would get shifted to the right, you know, in exactly the right spot. And that aggregate demand shift to the right is making that very low level of GDP and that very low level of employment and it's bringing it to the exact right level, maybe, you know, but at least moving it to the right. That's all horrible, horrible, terrible, horrible. I hate that. All right. Now, in back in micro 
Um, one of the things we learned about taxes is that they can be structured in different ways. They can be progressive, right? The more income you have, the higher percentage you pay. They could be proportional. We call that a flat tax. They could be regressive. Um, and it turns out, and um, liberals might like this, that the more progressive the tax system is, the more built-in stability there is. Um, because the higher a rate that rich people have to pay when GDP is really high and lots of people have employment and are making lots of money, they're also paying lots in taxes, more in taxes than if we had a less progressive system. All right, so this is a graph that uh, you might see on the AP exam. And essentially what it's about is that at low levels of GDP and when we're in recessions, um, how our government can actually automatically do expansionary fiscal policy and kind of automatically runs deficits, spends more than it takes in. Um, lots of government spending, low levels of taxes. Um, and at high levels of GDP, when aggregate demand might be too high and we might be facing inflation, how taxes automatically rise um, and how government spending in relation to taxes usually means that we're running surpluses and kind of taking money out of the economy. So if you look in this graph, um, what it's getting at is that at low levels of um, GDP, when the economy is doing badly, um, so we might be down towards the left in this graph, um, tax revenues are relatively low. You can see what they are right there. Um, lots of people who don't have jobs, lots of people who maybe have taken pay cuts, and so they're paying less taxes. Um, and so if the government might be spending this much money, but tax revenues, sorry about that, tax revenues are, are very low, essentially what's going to happen is that the government is automatically going to be running deficits. Now we're going to talk about what deficits are and why they matter and all that in the next couple of screencasts. Um, but the idea is that when the economy needs it, when AD is too low, government spending is usually high relative to tax revenues, uh, which is what we want. At really high rates of GDP and high aggregate demand, we get the opposite. So when the economy is doing really well, maybe too well, taxes tend to go up because more people have jobs and they're maybe earning more. And as a result of that, it's often the case that the government runs what are called surpluses, um, meaning that the government isn't spending as much money as it's taking in in taxes. So a final uh, point, and one of these matters more than the other, when the government does expansionary fiscal policy, when it either spends more money or cuts taxes and collects less money, it tends to run deficits, which is kind of like an individual who has to borrow money in order to um, live above their means. And that's essentially the idea. When the economy needs a little injection right, of spending, the government will live above its means a little bit and spend a little bit extra or cut taxes a bit more to push the economy you know, in the right direction. So the government has to get that money somewhere. Um, and it basically, it has two options, and one of them is more expansionary than the other. It can borrow the money. <clears throat> it could borrow the money from China or Japan or any number of other places. It could borrow it from us. Um, but there's a problem with that called the crowding out effect that we're going to be learning about in the next screencast. The other option is to print new money, create new money, which turns out to be more expansionary because it avoids this thing called the crowding out effect. I'll leave the crowding out effect, excuse me, <clears throat> again for the next screencast. On the other hand, when contractionary fiscal policy happens, when government spending goes down or taxes go up, the government finds itself with more money than it had before. And again, there's two options, and our country hasn't really had to deal with the problem of what to do with all of our extra money. Uh, but should the day come, the two options are these. Um, pay down whatever debts you might have incurred maybe during an expansionary phase. Um, and again, there's a problem there. It's called the reverse crowding out effect. And again, I'll leave that till the next screencast. The other option is to impound the money, which essentially just means take that money and hold on to it. Put it in some sort of lockbox which turns out to be more contractionary because essentially they're taking that money and they're just removing it from the system, um, which is another way of kind of making aggregate demand go down. All right, that screencast was maybe more minutia than the prior two, um, but you do need to know the difference between discretionary and automatic fiscal policy. 
And the idea that expansionary fiscal policy tends to turn into deficits or um, cause deficits to happen, whereas, whereas contractionary fiscal policy tends to cause surpluses. This is a very unusual sight, a sloth in a hurry. It wants to defecate, and the only place it's happy doing that, oddly enough, is down on the ground. It only does it about once a week, but why does it come down to the ground to do it? And why does it nearly always choose to do so in exactly the same place?